Hi guys, it's Mr. Y. Today's lecture is titled Life's Interactions. This is part of our ecology unit and we're going to be covering all these terms here on the screen. So make sure you're taking notes as we go through each of these um, and ask questions of me in class if there's something that's not clear, but some of this you should have seen before in middle school. All right, so first words are biotic and abiotic. Now, these can uh, seem simple enough, but they can have some confusing parts to it. So biotic refers to anything that is living or that was once living or alive. So obviously you yourself are biotic, animals, plants, protists, funguses, bacteria, those are all biotic things. Um, keep in mind, the more, thing, the more common things that are confused that are thought to be abiotic, and abiotic referring to anything that is not alive and never has been alive, uh, when we talk about things like wood or uh, coal or oil, keep in mind those are actually biotic because they were once, they are basically fossils in the case of coal and oil, and of course wood was once part of a plant. So those are actually under the biotic umbrella, whereas abiotic can include things like rocks, of course, water, air here for clarification but those are abiotic things things that have never been alive never will be alive and it depends on what type of fossil you're talking about you know if it's coal and oil that's obviously a fossil fuel but if you're talking about like petrified remains probably gonna spell this wrong that's actually abiotic because the minerals have replaced and just taken the shape of an organism. They're not actually what was part of the organism. So the fossils can be a bit confusing on this, and some other things can be, but usually most people understand the basics of biotic and abiotic already. So our next word is the term niche or niche. There's really no correct way of saying it one way or the other. Um, it's how and where a species uses all of the methods at its disposal to help it to survive and reproduce, how it meets all of its needs for food, shelter, and all its interactions with the biotic and abiotic parts of its habitat. Um, and there's a few interesting things. People are generally you know, pretty presumptuous of the term niche, but there's a bit of a trick to it. A niche is very specific for each creature in an ecosystem. Let's say, suppose, uh, for an example, that I'm thinking about an animal, and let's see if you can guess what it is. The animal I'm thinking about is uh, of something with a very specific diet. It eats lots of green leafy leaves. It eats deciduous leaves. That is to say, it only eats these leaves. It doesn't eat, for the most part, any other type of meat. It's arboreal, meaning that it lives in trees. Uh, its digestion is very, very slow, such that it sleeps most of its life away, um, and it spends most of its time in trees. Now, you could be thinking, actually, about one of two different animals. You could be thinking, of course, about koalas, who are arboreal, eat very specific leaves, eucalyptus leaves, and nothing else, and sleep most of their time because the digestion is slow. Or you could, of course, also be thinking about the sloths here. So you have two possible answers for my little riddle, and you'll notice that what I was describing was how the creature survives, but those characteristics actually fit two different animals. The difference between them is that they are in two different parts of the world, koalas being in Australia and, of course, sloths being in South America. Um, this is what we represent by niche. It's a very specific use of all a species capabilities, but it's also in a specific time and in a spe specific location. So add this little part to your definition for the term niche as well. Two or more species cannot occupy the same niche, the same general position in an ecosystem at the same time or in the same location. Otherwise, there's gonna to be too heavy uh, competition leading to extinction for one of them. So you'll never find koalas and sloths on, in the same ecosystem naturally. Uh, they, they would end up competing for one another, typically speaking. So you can find similar niches across the world with different organisms, but they often behave or act or function the same basic way. So for instance, uh, koalas and sloths both have long claws for gripping leaves and climbing and helping themselves stay in trees. They're both slow moving, um, but you can't have two creatures occupying the same niche at the same time or place. Our next one is competition. This should be a fairly familiar one to you. This is when organisms try to use a resource in the same time at the same place. And 
usually it's not as intense as two organs trying to occupy the same exact niche but you can still of course get competition now there's two subtypes of competition there's intra specific competition and there's inter specific competition and i'm going to give you a quick way to remember the difference between the two intra with the a here is where you have competition within the same species so competition for instance like these rams or foxes here with inter-specific competitions, this is between different species. So, like these guys here for food, or i um, not sure if these are different species of plants, but those are somewhat different species of plants. Now, <clears throat> competition can be for anything. Food, water, mates, that's only an inter-specific competition system. Uh, territory, also an inter-specific competition system. Uh, for things like plants, they will compete, in fact, for sunlight. And so you can see, again, these plants over here on the right, they're actually competing for access to sunlight. If they don't get access to sunlight, they can't do photosynthesis. Um, in the case of animals, you can also have competition for perceived future access to things, be it food, water, or resources. Um, and so I tried to pick a variety of examples, like, for instance, these rams here are probably competing for access to mates whereas these foxes are probably competing for access to either food or territory these guys are definitely competing for food and that's an inter-specific competition and of course these plants here are in direct competition not just for access to sunlight but probably also in competition for access to water and the most nutritious type of soil for them to absorb the best um, vitamins from so our next term is something you should also be familiar with from middle school, that's predation. This is when an organism captures and feeds on another organism, costing the second organism, the prey, its life. Now, uh, I've got several examples here, and of course you can find predators both on land and in the oceans and the seas, and of course in air as well. Um, keep in mind predators are not limited to being only animals. You can of course have a number of different species that are in fact carnivorous. And with the exception of, of the Venus flytrap here and of course the great white, I have in fact chosen uh, the rest of these examples all as native inhabitants of our region. This is the vinegaroon, the centipede, the coyote, the tarantula hawk wasp, and the um, mountain lion. So, Keep in mind, predation can happen in any environment, um, and it can be done also by plants as well. There's no uh, monopoly of that for animals. Our next term is going to be symbiosis. Now, symbiosis is any relationship in which two species live closely together. There are three types, and usually when people talk about a specific example of symbiosis, what they're usually describing is this first type, mutualism. We'll get into that next, but there's two other types of symbiosis. There's commensalism and parasitism. So our first type of symbiosis is typically what people uh, are talking about when they say the term symbiosis. What they really mean to say is mutualism. This is where both species benefit from the relationship that they have with one another. Both species gain from this. Um, so I'm using this little symbol here, plus plus, to signify that both sides of this relationship get a benefit. Uh, cleaner fish, for example, down here on the left, um, they get food from the larger fish that come to get cleaned of the parasites. So the cleaner fish gets the food, the other fish get cleaned of the parasites. Bees, of course, have a mutualistic relationship with the flowers that they visit. They gain the nectar while the flowers get pollinated, get cross-pollinated as the pollen is carried from one flower to another by the bee as it visits multiple flowers. Uh, clownfish over here on the right they clean away any fish or algae leftovers from the anemones they live in. And the anemones, they actually get more water flow. And that's good for them because that's how they get their food. They're filter feeders. They get um, their food from the water that flows by them. They can't go out and get it. So the, clean, the clownfish cleans away and gets free meals and a relatively safe space, uh, space to be. And the anemones get more food from the um, increased levels of water circulation. Second type of sim, uh, symbiosis is called commensalism. I'm signifying this with a plus and a zero. The reason is this is where one species benefits while the other is not helped, but it's also not harmed. So I'm using zero here as a neutral symbol. It's not a positive number, it's not a negative number, it's just there. So barnacles on a whale is a good example. Barnacles get, of course, pretty good shelter from living on the back of the largest animal in the world. Um, 
they don't help the whale, they don't harm the whale either. So the barnacles get the, all the benefit, the whale is neither helped nor is it harmed. Uh, you see this a lot in the plant kingdom where you have lichen or orchids living on larger trees or moss for instance, or this uh, growth here. They're not helping the trees that they live on, but they're not harming the trees either. They're just using it as a place to live and grow. So that's commensalism, plus and a neutral zero. Not helped, but not harmed. The last type of symbiosis is parasitism. This is where one species, the parasite, lives on or inside another organism. That's the host, we typically say, and does in fact harm it. So I use the symbols plus and negative. One side benefits, the other side is harmed by this relationship. Heartworms, tapeworms, fleas, ticks, roundworms, hookworms, these are all examples of parasites that will harm the host that they live on or inside. Now, I do want to make a distinction here. Parasites are not predators. That is to say, if the host in a parasitic relationship dies, the parasite is most likely going to die too. So the parasite is not actively trying to kill the host per se. The host might eventually die because of uh, the parasite. But it doesn't usually benefit the parasite to kill the host outright. So there is a difference between parasitism and predation. So if I was to put predation on the scale where you have a predator-prey relationship, the symbols I would probably use would be, well, obviously the predator in a predation relationship gets a benefit, but the prey is not just harmed, it's just outright killed. So there is a distinction between parasitism and predation, though you can kind of think of them as on the same spectrum. Uh, but parasites don't typically benefit if the host dies uh, very quickly. They can eventually lead to the death of the host, but usually it takes a while. So that's going to do it for this lecture, guys. Make sure you go back and rewatch as much as you need to to take as many notes as you need. Um, and also ask questions in class if there's something that's still confusing to you. All right. And I'll see you guys on the next lecture.